Hello, can you guess where I am today? I'll try to give you some hints here. You can see I'm at the grave of one noted gangster, John Dillinger. And uh, why am I at the grave of John Dillinger? Well, why not, for starters. Uh, but I thought I'd do another little story here from somewhere. And actually, the story is not about this guy here, but I'll give you a hint. Uh, the person I'm talking about today, his first name is John, and he is also a criminal. And the person we're talking about today in our story from somewhere is John Daniel Ehrlichman. So I don't know if many people nowadays recognize that name, but this was a very famous name back in the 70s and I suppose the 80s when uh, sort of the aftermath of water, the Watergate scandal was still in the air. And uh, John Ehrlichman was one of the key players in the, in the unfolding of the Watergate scandal. <clears throat> so let's get started here. John Ehrlichman was born in, well, I shouldn't say he was born in Seattle, but he was from Seattle, Washington. So he was among the many of the Nixon administration who came from the Western U.S., which was just then kind of coming into its own as being a, you know, a, a place where people live and where there was a, uh, some influence growing uh, from people out West. And uh, he, during World War II, he was a navigator in a bomber, in an Air Force bomber, and flew a, quite a few missions over Germany. And so the, <clears throat> that was kind of an interesting start to his life, I would say. And uh, after the war, like many returning veterans, he decided to go to college. So he attended the University of California in Los Angeles. And while at US UCLA, Ehrlichman met, met a guy who would be very sort of pivotal in the rest of his life and how things unfolded in his life. And the person he met at UCLA was a guy by the name of Bob Haldeman. <clears throat> now there's going to be a lot of names in this story, so I'll try to, try to keep up with explaining who they are. Robert or Bob Haldeman was uh, a guy who, just like, just like John Ehrlichman, he was a Christian scientist by religion, for starters. And so they, they had that in common. And Bob, er, uh, Bob Haldeman went on to be Richard Nixon's chief of staff in the White House, which basically meant that uh, he was pretty much the most powerful person in the Nixon White House, you know, directly surrounding Richard Nixon and controlled access to the president. Uh, both Haldeman and Ehrlichman would sort of go on to be part of what was known sometimes as the Berlin Wall because they sort of protected the president and they both had these Germanic sounding names. And sometimes also those people were called the German general staff because so many of them had these German names. But uh, in any case, I'm getting ahead of myself. So John Ehrlichman becomes friends with Bob Haldeman when they're at UCLA. That's where they first met. And after UCLA, Ehrlichman went on to Stanford where he got a, a law degree. So that's kind of the start to John Ehrlichman's life. It sounds like it's going to be a pretty good one, a pretty successful one. And uh, he goes and he starts a, a job as a lawyer in Seattle, Washington. And he's, <clears throat> he does that for many years. He's a lawyer specializing in land use. So, you know, what are the legalities of how this land can be used and, uh, and pollution and all those kind of things related to that. But he, ad <clears throat> he admits that he was getting pretty, re really very bored with that. So <clears throat> Haldeman, Bob Haldeman, his friend from UCLA, has gotten connected with a guy named Richard Nixon well before Nixon was ever president. And Haldeman really viewed Nixon as this, uh, just the greatest guy there ever was, right? If you ask Bob Haldeman, Nixon was just, he was just perfect and he was just like this saint who, you know, was an amazing person. Well, Ehrlichman never took that view of Nixon. I think Ehrlichman was a much more kind of realistic guy. 
and very he couldn't kind of fool himself. So he saw Nixon's flaws, but the point being that through Bob Haldeman, who was this great fan of Richard Nixon even before Nixon was ever president, Ehrlichman kind of came into the, into the Nixon circle or the realm of Richard Nixon for the first time because Ehrlichman was kind of saying, oh, I'm so bored here, and Haldeman said, well, you know, Richard Nixon is planning on running for president in 1960, so why don't you come work on the, compa the, on the campaign with us? <clears throat> So Ehrlichman said, all right, sounds like a big adventure. I'm going to do it. I'm going to give up my law practice for now, at least, and go on the campaign trail with who, Richard Nixon, who was at that point running for president for the first time. And uh, as it turned out, it was one of the closest elections up to that time in American history. Uh, basically, Nixon lost to John Kennedy by an extremely small margin. and. Uh, of course, it's kind of a famous story because there was probably some, some uh, chicanery, you might say, on the side of uh, the Kennedy campaign, which was nothing unusual. I mean, in those days, it was just sort of assumed that you were going to do these kind of things. But um, <clears throat> Kennedy ended up winning Illinois by some, some methods that were probably, let's say, very questionable. And so in the end, Nixon lost that very close election, partly perhaps because of some things that were done by the Kennedy campaign that were uh, basically below the belt, right? But again, that was the norm back then, and I imagine it probably to some extent still is. And so I guess what I'm saying here is that uh, some of the things that Nixon and his campaign later did probably nothing new, right, except for the fact that it, it was something that turned, that blew up into this big thing, which we'll talk about later. <clears throat> so anyway, Ehrlichman works with his buddy Bob Haldeman on the 1960 Nixon campaign. Nixon barely loses to Kennedy, and so then he's got to decide, Nixon's got to decide, all right, what am I going to do now? So what he decides is he wants to run for governor of California which was one of the more unfortunate decisions in Richard Nixon's life. Uh, not, not the most unfortunate, but <clears throat> what happens is he's not really well matched or well positioned in this election and he ends up losing. Nixon has been known to uh, like to have a few drinks sometimes, so after you know the night of this loss of the, the race for governor of California, he apparently had been tipping a few back for most of the night and the next morning was quite hung over, uh, didn't shave or anything and was kind of walking out of his hotel when some reporters were kind of there trying to ask him questions and unwisely Nixon kind of came, <laughs> impromptu came up in front of them and basically declared in kind of a grumpy way that they're not going to have Nixon to kick around anymore uh, because he'd lost this election and that was it, he was done. So. That was Nixon's hangover after losing uh, the race for governor of California in 1962. My point here being uh, that <clears throat> Ehrlichman also worked on that campaign along with Bob Haldeman. And so again, he's, he's sort of getting this chance to run off and have these adventures, kind of like I think in his, in his book, Ehrlichman compares this to running off to the circus every once in a while, right? So, so you know, sometimes he'll be in his law practice in Seattle, and then whenever Nixon has a new campaign, he'll run off to the circus, as he kind of uh, compares it to, have this big adventure, meet all kinds of interesting people. Uh, he, he really liked to meet new people and, and influential people, so that gave him a chance to kind of have this um, excitement in his life every once in a while to get away from the everyday kind of boring stuff. So okay, Nixon loses for governor in 62. He says he's finished, but <clears throat> as the years go by, of course, he starts thinking, you know what, I should really try again for being president because it seems like this one I could, I could probably win this, you know. Uh, so he runs in 1968 once again for president, and again, Bob Haldeman is basically, you know, the number one guy on the campaign, and John Ehrlichman, the, <clears throat> the subject of today's video, of course, is along, along as well. And uh, he, he's not real close to Nixon throughout most of these campaigns he's working on, but in 68, he does start to get pretty close to Nixon. In 1968, 
Nixon did actually win, although once again it was a very close election. And uh, you know he he was sort of like uh, almost going to lose because his his um, the Democratic candidate Hubert Humphrey was really sort of gaining on him in the last week or so before the election. So he just barely Nixon just barely squeaked by, and he was uh, finally got to be president as he'd sort of been trying to do for a long time. There's a little Bambi over here behind me. I don't know if you can see that. So today I am at, uh, I forgot to mention, oh there's two Bambis, I uh, forgot to mention the name of the place I'm at which is Crown Hill Cemetery and we're in Indianapolis, Indiana. So there's your Bambi sighting for today. One thing I want to point out to you that Ehrlichman was not, he was not, first of all, not a committed Republican or a committed Democrat for that matter. He wasn't really a political guy and he wasn't really doing this because of his political beliefs. Again, he was doing it because it was adventurous, it was interesting to him. So he wasn't a Nixon, he wasn't like Haldeman who just had this great belief in Richard Nixon. He wasn't there because he liked Nixon or because he thought Nixon was the greatest guy ever. He was just there for something interesting and, uh, you know, that was... Um, kind of the extent of it. When Nixon's elected president, he starts off for the first year he was in the White House, Ehrlichman serves as Nixon's legal counsel. But soon he moves on, after about a year, he moves on to the position of being Nixon's uh, chief domestic policy advisor, which is a pretty important position. And uh, <clears throat> so this is a pretty big step up in the White House and he has, when he becomes the domestic policy advisor, he is he is much more frequently in direct contact with Richard Nixon in, in the Oval Office and in, involved in lots of different uh, conversations, important conversations such as these deer and I'm sure they see lots of people so they're just kind of standing there looking at us, not too worried. Let's see how close I can get before they decide that's too close. Oh, time to stand up. How's it going? We're talking again about John Ehrlichman today. Oh, one of them made a noise. Now we have the three males who are being a little more courageous, it would seem. Let's see how long it takes them to. Yeah. You can see the two Bambis over there. Oh man, I hope my camera work is okay. I just realized I was pointing the camera straight into the sky there. But, um, so this is one of the coolest things that you, I would imagine, most certainly would see if you come to the Crown Hill Cemetery early in the morning, which is when I'm here. This one's actually coming towards me. <laughs> or possibly in the evening as well. I don't think you would see them as much in the uh, middle of the day. One of the things that you, um, <laughs> one of the things that you, you realize when you start reading books and that kind of thing about the Nixon administration is that uh, Nixon liked to vent a lot to the people around him privately. So he would sometimes get upset and he would tell people around him to do things that were very ill-advised and oftentimes illegal. And so when you were when you were around Nixon, you had to sort of take things with a grain of salt and make a judgment call on whether you were really going to do what he told you to do in, in some cases. So that's what Ehrlichman and his buddy Haldeman and a lot of the other people around Nixon would have to do. So let me give you an example of something like this. Need a little background here. So... There was something around the time that Nixon became president, actually right before, there was something called the bombing halt. And this had to do with the Vietnam War. Then President Lyndon Johnson was still in office. It was getting to the end of his time. And he thought to himself, you know, if I, <clears throat> if I stop the bombing of, of Vietnam and I can get the 
the North Vietnamese to come to the come to the table and discuss, you know, how we're going to end this war. I bet you that my vice president is going to get elected because the voters are going to say to themselves, "Wow, the election's coming up and Johnson's, you know, he's about to end this war." And so let's elect his vice president, right? This is good news. This things are going the right way, right? So that's what Johnson's kind of thinking to himself. So he says, "All right, the election's almost here." I'm going to have this bombing halt, as it became known, and try to bring the North Vietnamese to the table right at, right at the time of the election, the presidential election. And of course, Nixon realizes, ooh, this is trouble, right? If, if Johnson's really able to pull this off, if he can really end the, the Vietnam War right at the time of the election, then Nixon realizes he's going to lose, right? Especially in a close election like this one. So what Nixon does on his part, because obviously both sides here are doing things that aren't really totally legitimate, right? But so what Nixon does, he, he says, all right, we got to do our part to get elected here. We're going to try to sabotage this, uh, par the Paris peace talks that were sort of the result of this bombing halt. So he has Kissinger as well as this, this lady who uh, her name was um, Madame Chenault. And she was married to kind of a famous World War II uh, American Air Force guy named Claire Chenault. He was the leader of the Flying Tigers in China. So anyways, Madame Chenault, who is a Chinese woman, uh, she, along with Henry Kissinger, who was also at these Paris peace talks is in some role actually with the Johnson administration, I think, they sort of um, try to make sure that there there is no peace agreement to, to end the Vietnam War prior to the election, right? So that Nixon can still can still perhaps win this election. So anyways, that's the story behind the bombing halt. And the reason why this is important is because I'm trying to give you an example of something Nixon would do or say as president that in the end his people around him really had to just sort of uh, ignore, right, or let it go by their ears and not actually follow it through. Because Nixon, as soon as he becomes president, he gets really worried that there's this file at a place called the Brookings Institute. And in this file, supposedly, are the records of not only the bombing halt, which was something that Lyndon Johnson had ordered, but also of Nixon and his campaign's efforts to sort of sabotage the peace talks that were underway between Johnson's government, the U.S. government, and the North Vietnamese government, and of course that is not legal for someone who is not a, you know, not a government representative to try to sabotage some kind of um, government effort such as the uh, Paris peace talks. So Nixon gets really worried partly because he thinks that in this, in this uh, dossier at the Brookings Institute, there may be evidence of him and his campaign trying to sabotage these peace talks. But the other reason he wants this, this dossier from the <clears throat> Brookings Institute is that he thinks he can sort of use it against Lyndon Johnson or to use it to kind of prove that if he needed to that, um, you know, this was being, this bombing halt was being done perhaps partly to to get favor of, of voters <clears throat> for his, for Johnson's candidate. So anyway, Nixon basically tells, repeatedly tells uh, people around him in the White House, including Bob Haldeman, <clears throat> to break into the Brookings Institute and get this, get this bombing halt, halt file. There was even a plan sort of concocted by which they would get the file by basically starting a fire at the Brookings Institute. And then they would have someone from the White House dressed as a fireman go in grab the file while there's this fire going on. <laughs> so it actually went so far as to have a plan as to how to do this. But in the end, <clears throat> the people around Nixon, this is an example of an order that they had to ignore, right? Because if they get caught doing this, the benefit of, not, of doing it successfully is, is not as good as if they get caught, it's going to be a huge, you know, a huge ordeal, a huge scandal. It's illegal. Now I'll give you an example of something where John Ehrlichman was involved and this was something that um, 
basically went forward. We don't know that Richard Nixon ordered it or not, but it went forward with the idea that Rick, Richard Nixon would, would support this. So let me describe to you what happened next in this, in this uh, twisting story leading up to Watergate and John Ehrlichman's resignation. So the next thing that happens is in 1971, a guy named Daniel Ellsberg had access to something called the Pentagon Papers. And if you don't know, the Pentagon Papers were this huge <clears throat> collection of information about how the U.S. government viewed Vietnam and the relationship between the United States and Vietnam dating all the way back to the Truman administration, actually, which is, you know, a long time before Nixon was president. So this was a huge document that had a lot of history in it. And inside of this is all kinds of important information that the U.S. government doesn't want made known to just the whole world, because it basically gives away a lot of, um, a lot of the American approach to dealing with Vietnam and the Vietnam War and that kind of thing. <clears throat> so there's lots of secrets in here and Daniel Ellsberg decides, you know what, I have, access, I have access to this big document and inside of this document there is evidence that it's been known for a long time that the Vietnam War is not going well at all. And both the Kennedy administration and especially the Lyndon Johnson administration both had portrayed Vietnam up to that time as being a war that was very winnable, as being a war where America was making progress, and that we were on the path to victory in the Vietnam War. That was the way that especially Lyndon Johnson and his administration had portrayed the war. So Daniel Ellsberg sitting there thinking, you know, I've read this thing, and there's lots of evidence in, this, in these Pentagon papers to suggest that not only are we not winning this war, we're losing it, and we probably don't have much chance of winning it. And so basically, he releases these documents, these, the Pentagon Papers, as a way of showing the American public that what they're being told by their government is not accurate about the Vietnam War. Well, a lot of people wonder why Nixon would be upset about that, because the Pentagon Papers were actually released during the early part of Nixon's presidency. And they had stopped before Nixon was ever president. There wasn't really anything in the Pentagon Papers having to do with the Nixon and his with Nixon and his administration. So he gets all upset about this and a lot of people wonder why he gets so upset about the releasing of the Pentagon Papers. And <clears throat> the fact is that or the best evidence that we can find is that Richard Nixon really believed that this was a national security issue and that uh, the enemies of the United States were going to be able to use the Pentagon Papers to gain just tons and tons of ins information that they could then use against the U.S. And so it was really, I think, from Nixon's uh, perspective, it wasn't that he was somehow embarrassed by the Pentagon Papers as far as the contents themselves. They didn't really involve Richard Nixon. They involved Kennedy. They were very embarrassing towards Lyndon Johnson. But Nixon was upset because of the fact that this was such a huge national security leak, and if one guy got away with it, then that sort of gave permission for everybody else to get away with it too. So. Nixon was very, um, very upset about the Pentagon Papers, and he made that known. And basically what developed from this was that there was um, a plan to break in to, uh, to seize the records of Daniel Ellsberg, the person who had released the Pentagon Papers, to seize his psychological records. The idea behind this operation was that they wanted to know more information about Ellsberg. They found out that he'd been seeing a psychologist in Los Angeles. And so these people in the White House said to themselves, all right, let's go to this psychologist's office. We're going to break in and we're going to rifle through the files until we find Ellsberg's file. <clears throat> and then we're going to use that to sort of get more background on how can we 
you know, how can we go after Ellsberg, right, with this information? So there's lots of these, lots of these things going on here where people are trying to get files from some place that they, you know, may need to break into. In any case, this is where Ehrlichman first becomes involved in criminal activity as far as we know because what happened was this sort of fell within his purview and so the people who were going to break in and get get this psych psychologist file on Daniel Ellsberg they came to Ehrlichman and asked permission to do this they said all right <clears throat> now this is something that Ehrlichman actually disputes but most historians believe that they came to Ehrlichman and they said okay here's our plan we're gonna to go to LA we're gonna break into this psychologist's office and get these records of Daniel's, Daniel Ellsberg. <clears throat> and there is actually a piece of paper in existence which shows that John Ehrlichman signed off on this and he actually wrote something on the paper when he signed off and what he wrote was I'm gonna look at my notes here to get the exact words <clears throat> but they were they were very incriminating. He wrote if done under your assurance it is not traceable. So basically what Ehrlichman's saying here is, okay, go ahead, I'm gonna sign off on this, but you better not get caught because we know it's illegal. So this later kind of comes back to be a problem for John Ehrlichman, as you can imagine. But that's for a little bit later in this story. In any case, he signs off on this. Now he's always claimed, I have to present his side of the story here. He's always claimed that on this paper that he signed off that it wasn't specifically stated that they were going to do anything illegal. So he always says, they didn't tell me that they were actually going to break into this guy's office. They just told me they were going to try and find some, find some dirt on, you know, the background of Daniel Ellsberg. So that's John Ehrlichman's version of it was that he signed off on this but that he didn't know the specifics that there would be so, that they would be breaking the law by going into the breaking into the psychologist's office. In any case, I think it's probably more likely that he knew the details of it and that he signed off on it and that he basically was saying go ahead and do this as long as you don't get caught. Which was again nothing unusual and probably still isn't terribly unusual. This is a um, Civil War area of this cemetery. It's a huge cemetery, but one thing I've learned in the past about these Civil War graves is that the ones with the... Uh, there are those that have a pointed top on them, and I don't see any pointed top ones in this section, but I believe the pointed top ones are the... Um, the Confederate graves, and then the ones with the rounded tops, I believe, are the Union graves, is sort of like how you can tell the difference. And uh, a lot of people wonder when they go up north, like we're here we are in the northern U.S., why you would have Confederate gravestones, which there are some in the cemetery, I know. And the reason for that is a lot of prisoners of war were taken to places like Indiana, when they were captured and then they would end up dying in, in captivity from you know all the different diseases that would that would be very easily caught in those kind of conditions back at that time um, so you do actually see quite a few confederate graves in the north in places like this so Ehrlichman had signed off on this I, this whole concept of these guys are going to go to LA they're going to break into the psychologist office named Dr. Fielding and they're gonna grab Daniel Ellsberg's file and try to use that against him since he was the guy who had released these secrets in the Pentagon Papers. Well they went and they broke in and apparently they weren't able to find much of anything but it was a huge disaster basically because now they've committed this crime and they've really gotten nothing out of it. And so Ehrlichman got really panicked when he found out uh, how all of this had went down. Debatable whether he knew the details ahead of time, but he basically shut down the, the whole idea and they, they just sort of decided we're not going to pursue this any further. It's already been kind of like um, not, not going well. So 
Um, <clears throat> so that's an example of how Jer John Ehrlichman first got involved in committing crimes for Richard Nixon or within the uh, Nixon administration was by approving this operation that I just uh, that I just pointed out. The next way that Ehrlichman got involved in criminal activity was actually a, in the Watergate scandal itself. Now at first he wasn't really very involved with Watergate at all. He was not involved in any of the planning of it or any of that kind of stuff. And even after it had happened he really, it wasn't something that he really dealt with very much. However, um, as time went on and as sort of the, they decided to cover things up more and more, that's when Ehrlichman became more involved. The first person to, to really handle the, the cover-up or the keeping quiet of what really happened with Watergate was a guy named John Dean, who later became famous as the person who went in front of Congress and basically spilled the beans on Watergate. But John Dean was Nixon's lawyer, Nixon's counsel, and he initially was in charge of making sure that, you know, this Watergate thing didn't go any farther. So, for example, paying, paying off the uh, people who had done the break-in and that kind of stuff to, to try to buy their silence. Well, after a while, Dean really starts to, they start to remove Dean from that role of being the cover-up guy. And they start shifting John Ehrlichman more into that role. And officially, Ehrlichman's role became one of trying to establish exactly what has happened up to that point. So after Dean kind of starts to pull away from the, that role, Ehrlichman comes in and he starts to try to establish, here's exactly what happened and here's who's, here's who's most compromised by what's happened. And it, as, as part of him establishing all of this, he sort of becomes implicated in the cover-up of Watergate and the Watergate break-in itself, which, if, if you don't know, it's possible that people who are very young don't even really know what Watergate is, but I won't go into that other than to say it was a major... Uh, <clears throat> it, was a, it was basically an illegal break-in that was undertaken, and the real crime ended up being, at least for Nixon, that he, rather than kind of coming clean on it, and saying, all right, this happened, it, I didn't order it, and we're, we're firing everybody and prosecuting whoever was involved. Rather than doing that, Nixon followed the course of trying to cover it up, which in the end results in obstruction of justice. In other words, a crime. Well, that's interesting because John Ehrlichman, being, he was kind of a, an out-of-the-box thinker and kind of like... He wasn't afraid to sort of speak his mind on things that may have been a little unusual. And his view of this from very early on, and this is what he advised Nixon to do, was to come clean. Very early on and, and from then on throughout Watergate, Ehrlichman was, I think, probably the lone, the lone major voice advising Richard Nixon to just go in front of the, go in front of the press say what happened, clean house, and move on. That was Ehrlichman's view of the best way to handle the whole Watergate situation. But unfortunately, Nixon decided to go the way of trying to cover it up, trying to make it go away, basically. And in the process of trying to make it go away, not only Nixon got involved in a crime of, of obstruction of justice, but also a lot of the people around him, Bob Haldeman became involved, John Ehrlichman became involved, along with a number, a number of other people. Nixon had come to the point where he could no longer continue to keep Ehrlichman on the White House staff, and he had to clean house. And Nixon tend to be, tended to be really loyal to the people around him. He, he held on to Ehrlichman longer probably than he should have, given how compromised both he and Bob Haldeman were in this Watergate scandal, or at least the cover-up thereof. But at some point it gets so bad that he has to get rid of not only Ehrlichman, but also Haldeman. And so, as John Ehrlichman tells the story of how all this went down, is that Bob Haldeman, his old buddy from UCLA and now the chief of staff in the White House, 
calls him up and says, John, the president is going to ask for our resignations tomorrow. <clears throat> and we're going to fly out to Camp David where Nixon was, was staying and he's going to ask for our resignations, which is what they did. So Ehrlichman called for a White House car and that took him to the, to the Pentagon where there was a helicopter pad. Both he and Bob Haldeman hopped on a helicopter and they flew the short distance to Camp David, which is in Maryland, <clears throat> to meet with Nixon. And Nixon was in tough, uh, in tough shape. But basically, the way it went down was Haldeman went in first. So Haldeman walked to this little place where Nixon was. And <clears throat> Nixon basically told him, look, you're going to have to resign. I feel terrible about this. So then Haldeman comes back and says to John Ehrlichman, OK, it's your turn. So Ehrlichman uh, walks to, to where Nixon's at and basically comes into the room and basically uh, Richard Nixon was visibly broken up, right? He was visibly um, in, tough, in tough condition. And again, this, is, this isn't likely Richard Nixon acting because Richard Nixon wasn't a very good actor, for one thing. Uh, so this was real legitimate Nixon feeling bad about the fact that his closest advisors and friends were having to leave the White House in disgrace because of something that maybe Nixon should have done better or some failings on the part of Richard Nixon. And so he was, um, as, as Ehrlichman describes it, Nixon uh, cried. Nixon said, actually, that he hoped the night before when he went to bed that he wouldn't wake up in the morning and have to do this. In any case, Nixon did wake up, and he did, in a very difficult way, ask John Ehrlichman for his resignation. So, at this point, Obviously, Ehrlichman's life shifts from one where he's in a very powerful position, direct access to the President of the United States, to one where he is now under investigation. As soon as he gets back to the White House, the FBI is there outside his office, and <clears throat> they are basically, they confiscate all of his, all the contents of his office, all of his records. And um, <clears throat> from that point on, it became a life of uh, appearing in front of congressional hearings as well as appearing in courtroom courtrooms as a defendant in criminal cases. His resignation was in April of 1973 and Ehrlichman's view of this at the time that he, re he was forced to resign and thereafter was one of unfairness. He was very upset with Richard Nixon from that point on because Ehrlichman had this sense of, of fairness and the importance of treating people fairly, doing things based on what's, what's right versus what's uh, politically correct and that kind of thing. And so Ehrlichman knew there were tons of people in the White House who were just as compromised as he was in, these, in the Watergate situation, and they weren't being told to resign. Only he and Bob Haldeman and John Dean <clears throat> were basically forced to resign. Why is he being forced to resign and have this bad name for the rest of his life? Was his view of it. And he wanted a pardon. He wanted a pardon from Richard Nixon. And Nixon wouldn't do it. And as a side note, Ehrlichman did also later seek a pardon from Ronald Reagan, which was not granted either. So in any case, Ehrlichman gets really kind of bitter about this. And from then on, after leaving the White House, he only talked to Richard Nixon one time, and that was shortly <clears throat> in that same year of 1973, where apparently Nixon called at Christmas time to kind of check in and wish him a, a happy Christmas. After that, he'd never had any more contact with Richard Nixon. So now we come to the area where John Ehrlichman is now spending his time speaking in front of Congress, testifying, as well as a courtroom defendant in these criminal charges. And 
particularly in the case where he was testifying in front of Congress, he gained a reputation of being sort of combative and abrasive. And he sort of um, took this attitude of, I'm going to fight, I'm going to fight back with these people in Congress who are questioning me and <clears throat> sort of trying to place blame on me and make a name for themselves in front of the camera. So in contrast to Bob, Bob Haldeman, who in those kind of situations sort of came off as this Boy Scout, um, who, you know, he, his courtroom demeanor was very sort of accommodating. And John Ehrlichman's courtroom demeanor, or his, especially his demeanor in front of Congress, was very, as I said, combative and abrasive. And he was sort of going to argue back with these congressmen if, if he didn't like the question or the implication. So he kind of got in it with people like Sam Irvin, who was a very powerful congressman who was kind of leading these congressional investigations. And the result of all this was that in the media and in public opinion, Ehrlichman be, came off as being really kind of an unlikable guy in comparison to his friend Haldeman. He came off as being this kind of like, uh, in some ways jocular, in some ways sort of um, off the cuff or uh, in other ways abrasive uh, personality. And he, he admits that that was a mistake on his part and that he was, he was upset about being dismissed as he viewed it unfairly and he was just going to fight, he was going to fight this. And it really didn't do him any good, uh, especially in the court of public opinion. So in the end, he has to go through two criminal trials. He's convicted first of the break-in of the, the psychologist, Dr. Fielding, Fielding's office. And then later, he's convicted along with Bob Haldeman and several others in the uh, matter of covering up Watergate. And he kind of hits bottom at this time where he's, he's going through all of these trials and all of this testimony in front of Congress to the point where he, um, he ends up having an affair with another woman. As he kind of describes it, it was like he didn't have anybody who, who was really supporting him. And this woman was this one person in the world who seemed to understand him and support him in a difficult time. And this ends up ruining his marriage, which was never apparently a very, uh, an especially good marriage in the first place. But he ends up getting a divorce at this time. And prior to going to prison, he spends some time in New Mexico in Santa Fe, where he does a little bit of painting and he does a little bit of maybe some pro bono work for people, legal work, as he's kind of waiting for it, for it to be time for him to enter jail. So he does enter prison and he serves at a little prison in Arizona that wasn't a very, you know, high security thing or anything like that. But he does serve 18 months in prison. And at this time, he sort of, he sort of says to himself, either I have to start trying again or I have to completely give up and basically end my own life was, was the, the state that he was in. He, that was the decision that he had to make. And so he decided that he would start trying again. He would try, you know, step by step to rebuild his life, to try to rebuild his reputation as best he could and his relationship with his kids and that kind of thing. And uh, just sort of little steps at a time, try to, to get his life back in, back in shape. And uh, these are the kind of stories I like because there's these big ups and downs in people's lives. That's one reason why I find Nixon or Ehrlichman so fascinating is because they go from these as, you know, Nixon would probably describe it as from being top of the mountain to bottom of a valley. And to me, that's very interesting. It's not boring. And so anyway, Ehrlichman was in the deepest of valleys there at that time. And after he got out of jail, he, uh, he went back to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and again, he's, he did some painting, and he starts writing books. And it turns out that he's a pretty good writer. You can read his own, his own account of his time in the Nixon White House. It's called Witness to Power, 
and it describes, you know, basically his life in and around Richard Nixon. And yeah, you know, he he really is. He's a pretty good writer. He writes his own he writes his own book, and he writes his own a uh, couple other books that were that were sort of nominally fiction, but they were based on some of his experiences in Washington D.C. And one of those books actually went on to be sort of like um, a TV mini like a little movie that was on TV. One of the major net, major networks did a, a movie version of it. So he's actually somewhat successful here as he gets out of prison and works his way into a little bit of a, a life as a writer. And, uh, you know, he seems to enjoy living out west and kind of just doing his own thing, painting, writing. But at some point, and I'm not sure why this is because he seemed to be sort of happier in his in his new life of writing painting living out west but for whatever reason he did later go on to accept a job in Atlanta as a senior vice president of a hazardous materials company and I don't know if it was that he just needed more money or what the situation was but this job actually had a lot more to do with his original work back in Seattle before he ever even met Richard Nixon when he was a land use attorney he became an expert on you know the legalities of land use and <clears throat> this really fit into his his new position here in Atlanta working for a hazardous materials company and you know all the legalities of can I dump my hazardous material right here you know so anyway <clears throat> He's actually in a pretty high position with this company, and that's kind of like the last position he had in his life before retiring. And um, basically, I think we could say that he made at least somewhat of a comeback. <clears throat>